This is Charles. So I'm going to be talking about the design of risk weights. And the context here is capital requirements for banks. Uh, capital requirements for banks are tied to risk weighted assets as opposed to just at total assets. Those are the risk weights that I'm talking about, the risk weights that go into the calculation of risk weighted assets. And make a couple of observations and tell you the, the, the main point of the, the paper. So the first obvious point to make is that risk weights matter. They have a significant incentive effect uh, that ends up shaping bank balance sheets. So when you assign a risk weight to one type of loan versus another type of loan, different risk weights, you're basically creating an incentive based on those relative risk weights for the bank to do more of one kind of lending versus another kind of lending. Because the risk weight determines how much capital the bank needs to hold against that kind of activity. So risk weights create incentives. And if we look back at the kinds of asset categories that are implicated in the financial crisis, subprime mortgages, European sovereign debt, trading assets versus traditional banking activities, those are all examples where, in retrospect, the risk weights on those assets were too low. Okay? Had we had higher risk weights on subprime mortgages, European sovereign debt, banks would have had smaller holdings in those categories. So risk weights matter. They create powerful incentives. If you look at the thousands of pages of documentation that goes behind the evolution of risk weights, you won't find anywhere a statement of what is the principle on which risk weights are based. So I think there's widespread agreement that the, the risk weights in current use are wrong. But there's really no understanding of what it means for risk weights to be right. Nobody has come out and said, this is the principle on which risk weights should be defined. If you don't state on what principle you want to define your risk weights, it's very difficult to say whether you've got them right or wrong. The recommendations that come out of our uh, analysis, so first of all, based on some, some assumptions that I'll be uh, describing, First point we make is that the right principle for setting risk weights has nothing directly to do with risk itself. Risk weights should be proportional to the profitability of an asset category and not to the risk in the asset category. Now, that's, uh, you immediately would encounter a practical obstacle if you tried to implement that because regulators don't know the profitability of an asset category. But they do get to see what banks are doing. And so the practical recommendation that comes out of this model is that regulators should adapt risk weights in response to changes in bank portfolios. And then what we show, so basically, I mean, the, the, the short version of that is that if you see banks moving into subprime mortgages very aggressively, you increase the risk weight on subprime mortgages. Uh, and then you get less subprime lending. Um, and what we show is, so, so we, we put forward a precise way in which that uh, response to bank portfolios should be implemented. And what we show is that regulators can achieve the same obje objective with that uh, adaptive method that they would be able to achieve if they had full knowledge of the asset characteristics. Okay? So th that's basically everything I had to say in a nutshell. And then we'll just sort of walk through that now in, uh, in a little more, more detail. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Juan Mo Kong, who uh, graduated from uh, Columbia several years ago and is uh, now on the faculty at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. So uh, the way these capital requirements work, so since the 1980s, Basel I, most capital requirements for bank are tied to risk-weighted assets. So the, the, the typical form is you've got a requirement that capital, and you can think of capital here as equity plus some other stuff. But think of it as roughly equity. Divided by risk-weighted assets rather than total assets has to be greater than or equal to some minimum required ratio. Uh, I think in some ways it's, it's easier to think about this by flipping the ratio. If you flip the ratio, then what you're saying, instead of saying you have a lower bound on the capital requirement, you have an upper bound on leverage. That's really what this is doing if you just look at the reciprocal of that ratio. Right? Now, the definition of exactly what gets counted as capital varies by specifically which of the many capital requirements you're looking at. Um, but I'm going to be talking about the, the risk weighting that goes into the denominator. So Basel III, so the latest uh, incarnation. So, ba so Basel II substantially complicated, expanded the, the complication of the way the risk weighting is done. Basel III has primarily put a lot of emphasis on the numerator, narrowing what counts as capital. 
and also making the required capital ratio more stringent. Okay? But problems with the denominator have not been fixed. The risk weights are basically, for the most part, the same as they were before. Now, just to help fix ideas, let's walk through a little example here, uh, a Basel I example. So Basel I had just four categories. Uh, that should be 20%. There was a 10%, but it was never used, as far as I can tell. So there, it's 0%, 20%, 50%, and 100%. Suppose we've got a minimum required ratio of 8%, and let's suppose I have $8 in capital. So that allows me to have up to $100 in risk-weighted assets, right, and to satisfy that ratio. So what can I do? How can I comply with this requirement? Well, so I can make $100 in corporate loans because the risk weight on all corporate loans is 100%. So $100 in corporate loans, that's equal, the risk weighted assets are equal to total assets in that case. So I could make up to $100 in corporate loans, but I could make up to $200 in residential mortgage loans because those get a risk weight of 50%. And I could make uh, up to $500 in short-term loans to banks because those get a risk weight of 20%. And there's no limit on how much money I can lend to the Greek government because all OECD sovereigns have a risk weight of 0%. <coughs> so lending to Greece, according to this scheme, is less risky than, say, lending to Apple, right? Because Apple gets a risk weight of 100%. So you can see that this is, first of all, a very crude scheme. And hopefully you can see that also this kind of scheme is going to create very strong incentives. This is going to have a big influence on what sort of asset mix uh, a bank is going to end up choosing. So, now, as I said, Basel II is vastly more complex, and the idea is to make it more risk-sensitive. This is not a particularly risk-sensitive scheme. Make it more risk-sensitive in the way the risk-weighted asset calculation works. It also differs from this kind of cookie-cutter approach in the sense that it leaves more discretion to qualified banks, banks that get their models approved and show that they have sort of the, the right sophistication to do a better job than just following uh, a formula like this. All right, so do risk weights matter? So as I said before, yes, they create strong incentives that shape bank balance sheets. In fact, now more than ever, because banks feel more tightly capital constrained, they're more motivated to, uh, to, to try to do the best they can subject to these risk weighted asset constraints. And in fact, if you Google RWA optimization, you'll see that there's a long list of consulting firms that have gotten into this business of helping banks kind of get the most out of their uh, investment subject to these constraints on risk-weighted assets, uh, you might think of that as, in effect, a kind of regulatory arbitrage, right? Let's, the, the, once the regulators have put the, the rules forward, let's see how effectively we can beat the system. Uh, and as I said before, getting the risk weights wrong leads to overinvestment over in underpriced risks. So again, real estate, sovereign debt, trading activities versus banking activities. Those are all examples where, in retrospect, if we look back, we would say that the risk weights associated with those were too low, and therefore, we got sort of too much of a good thing. So as I said before, it's, uh, I think we can recognize when risk weights are wrong, uh, but what does it mean to get the risk weights right? Well, one, all right, well, so, so a couple of other sort of broad questions to think about in thinking about this question of risk weighting. So should capital requirements be set relative to risk-weighted assets or total assets? All right. I think the right answer here is both. I mean, if you ignored risk completely, then you're sort of penalizing banks that make hold safer assets versus riskier assets. On the other hand, since you never really believe you're going to get the risk-weighting scheme completely right, I think it also makes sense to have an overall leverage ratio, which the US has, o has always had, not Europe. Uh, in fact, there was recently a bill introduced that would have taken the U.S. completely off of the risk weighting scheme. I think that's unlikely to be successful. So I think the right answer is uh, that you want to have both a risk weighted constraint and a, total, a constraint on total leverage. So if we're going to have risk weights, well, on what principles should these be set? So as I mentioned before, in our analysis, theoretically, it turns out that you want to set the risk weights proportional to profitability and not proportional to risk. And I'll say a little bit about why that's true. And then, as I said already, the practical recommendation that comes out of this is that they should be adaptive to changes in bank portfolios. As you see banks doing more and more investment of, in one kind of asset category, increase the risk weight on that asset category. Uh, there's a whole other set of issues which comes down to how prescriptive should they be versus how much discretion you should leave to banks. That's a, a topic, an important topic, but it's a topic for another day. All right. Um, 
So people talk about uh, RWA density, which is the ratio of risk-weighted assets to total assets. If you believed that you were getting the risk weights right, then a low density, a low ratio of risk-weighted assets to total assets would mean what? Low ratio of risk-weighted assets to total assets presumably would mean that that is a very safe bank, right? Low risk. Whereas a high ratio of risk-weighted assets to total assets would mean a riskier bank. Well, let's just focus on this axis here and let's see who's at the kind of the high end of this ratio, which if we believed in this ratio would be telling us kind of the riskier banks. Well, among the US banks, those are the ones in red, Wells Fargo is up near the top and Citi is down near the bottom. Well, of course, that seems exactly backwards, right? So Wells Fargo fared particularly well and Citi particularly poorly. This is as of 2007 through the crisis. And in fact, all the US banks are up in the upper end of the scale and at the lower end, of the European banks tend to be at the lower end. So some of the banks towards the lower end, you've got UBS, Dexia, RBS. So these are banks that did particularly poorly during the financial crisis and yet they are at the low end. So I think the implication of this is that a low ratio doesn't so much mean that you've got low risk as you've done a very good job sort of arbitraging the risk weighting scheme. Kind of a related, now there, I should say there are important accounting differences that, that make the US banks and the European banks not directly comparable, but the US banks never fully moved off of Basel I and that's part of the reason why you've got the US banks in the upper region here and the uh, European banks kind of in the, the lower region. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, here's, a, here's a picture from the Bank of England showing um, Risk weights from, from 1994 uh, till the present, risk weights, the average risk weight declined. These are for the largest 17 global banks, whereas total leverage tended to increase. So again, more evidence that what's really going on here is more effective kind of arbitraging of the risk weighting as opposed to lower risk taking. All right, so, uh, so what do we do? So two assumptions of our model. So first, we, there's a risk sensitivity assumption. So we assume that a bank would incorporate risk into its portfolio selection even without a regulatory constraint. Okay? Now you could debate whether you believe that or not, but at least we're being explicit about what we're assuming here. So we, we assume that the bank would take risk to some extent, though not to the same extent that the regulator seeks. All right, so that's, that's actually important to make that assumption. The second is maybe um, more open to discussion, and this is this por portfolio neutral premise. So the premise here is that the regulator seeks to limit the total amount of risk that banks take, takes, but without changing the relative mix of assets. So the regulator is not here trying to impose a view that we need to make more loans to farmers and fewer loans to commercial real estate developers. The, the, the regulator is agnostic on what the right mix is and, and actually is not trying to change the relative mix, but just sort of the total scale of the bank to limit its risk. Now, we could say that we have a public policy objective that we need to have more loans to farmers, but that would be, you know, in some sense, that would be a different question. So it just in terms, that shouldn't really be the objective in designing uh, the risk weights for the risk weighting scheme. So if you make those two assumptions, and uh, you, know, you can read the paper if you want to go through all the details, we show that the regulator can, in fact, achieve this objective if it makes the risk weight for each category proportional, as I said, to the profitability of that asset category and not simply to the risk of each asset category. In fact, making risk weights proportional to the risk of an asset category is the wrong answer. Because you will actually, it's wrong in the sense that you will end up distorting the relative mix of different kinds of assets. And, um, and our premise is that that's not what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to control the overall lim limit of risk, but you're not trying to push banks to do more of one kind of lending and less of another kind. This is actually consistent with some uh, earlier work and the intuition is that a bank will choose a mix of assets with an efficient risk return trade-off. So charging for high returns through risk weights has the net effect of limiting the overall risk that the bank takes. Now, there, as I said, that sort of it would be a difficult thing to implement in practice because you would need to know, a regulator would need to know a lot of information about the various asset characteristics. Now, but you can compensate that through this adaptive scheme where you increase the risk weight as the size of a category grows. So you see commercial real estate lending growing, increase the risk weight, construction loans growing, increase the risk weight, and so on. Changes in bank portfolios provide information to the regulator about which risk weights are too low. 
So when you see growth in one area, that's an indication that the risk weight there is too low. And then with this adaptive scheme, you can achieve the same objective you could achieve if you had full information. Now after, okay, so yeah, so just a little bit more on, on so the logic of this. So in practice, no set of risk weights will perfectly align with true risks. Banks are highly incentivized to exploit any mispricing, any errors in the risk weighting scheme and the capital charging scheme, and as I said, now more than ever. So what you'll see is that investment in underpriced assets, those where the risk weights are too low, is going to grow. And then these effects can be offset by increasing risk weights and response, uh, as I mentioned before. Now, after we had written the paper, we learned that the Reserve Bank of India has actually been implementing very much this sort of scheme. So this is a table from a report that they put out that shows how over time, in some broad categories, they have adjusted the risk weight. So for example, in commercial real estate, they, and you, if you read the text, you see that they're doing exactly what I described. I mean, not, the math is different, but so the principle is the same, that as they see banks moving heavily into commercial real estate, they increase the risk weight from 100 to 125 percent to 150 percent. Then post-financial crisis, they actually create a stronger incentive for lending by lowering the risk weight. Similarly, in capital markets activities, you see they increase the risk weight and so on. So they actually have a kind of crude version of this model. And I'm, I'm out of time. I'll just sort of highlight what would have happened uh, in retrospect. So this is the growth in various lending categories for U.S. commercial banks starting back in 2002, normalized so that they're all at one. So you see the large, the, the commercial real estate is the sector that, is the category of lending that grew the fastest. So in our scheme, that would have had an increase in the risk weight. Within real estate categories, the fastest growth was in construction and development loans. So that in particular would have had a high growth. And in Europe, this is the growth in uh, holdings of European sovereign debt by banks in the southern euro area. And you can see how that takes off here uh, starting in 2009. What's the risk weight on Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal? All zero, right? So if you're a southern euro area bank and you're very constrained by capital and you're looking for profitable assets, what are you going to do? You're going to go to zero risk weight assets that are paying a high yield, right? And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Had risk weights pushed back on that, you would have had a less strong incentive for uh, banks to move into that kind of uh, asset. Okay. So just to summarize, um, risk weighting schemes have a first order impact on bank behavior. And in both the design and implementation, risk weighting schemes need to be adaptive, not a static set of rules that you revisit once every 15 years or so, as the market will always evolve to exploit weaknesses in any fixed. Thank you.